Hey. <laughs> hey, everybody. Man, I feel like I haven't. Uh... Yeah, it's been a while for sure. It's definitely been a while. Um, so I have some new thoughts. <laughs> um, I haven't stopped thinking, but I've been really bu- I've been really busy. That's for sure. School's been uh, really kicking my ass. That's, yeah, school's been really kicking my ass. Yeah, that, that's the summary. Why I haven't why I haven't done any videos? <laughs> um, but. Regardless, I'm going to talk to you guys about Boober today, Martin Boober. Um, It's funny because, you know, I think I read, I think I read I and Thou like last, last summer, actually, for the first time. And I and Thou was such a moving, like, book it was such a moving philosophical poetic anthropological piece uh that it really kind of moved me um but ironically i am thou is probably the one book i've spent like a ridiculous amount of time on and every time i i re-engage with that book it's like there's just never enough, you know, there's just never enough to, I'm always finding something new when I engage with Martin Buber's I and Thou, you know. Um, but lately I've been thinking how the words that are used to describe Buber's kind of like logic, I guess, uh, at least in contemporary thought, I feel like it kind of falls flat. And I feel like to do Martin Buber more justice, I think it's fair to say that we should start engaging with new terms to possibly describe what is Buber talking about. Um, And ironically, this would be more true to Buber than actually um, trying to advocate for his thought while remaining with the same words. Um, One of those words that are very problematic um, in, in reading Buber is that a lot of people call Buber, um, that he has a kind of, he's a dualist. He has a, he has a kind of dualism um, in his philosophy. And it's ultimately because it's split between what is called as the I it and the I thou. But the, but to me, I don't think dualism actually gets at Buber. Like, I, I don't think that's like an accurate word, even though. Like, yes, it's, it's a dualism, right? It's, 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 you know, but it's not a dualism in the sense like there's good and then there's evil. It's a dualism that's dialogical. So it almost, it almost doesn't even make sense to call Buber's philosophy a kind of dualism just because what Buber is really trying to say, because his philosophy is ultimately dialogical, it's always between you and another being. That that is the whole point. It's between you and a, another being. Um, dualism beyond dualism. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I actually think the word between gets gets at Buber more than dualism itself. Because dualism, because it's the betweenness that Buber is actually concerned about, in my opinion. Um, and so, so to introduce two more terms to that, I'm going to add lack emergence and excess emergence, or we can call it 
emergent lack, the yeah, lack emergent and excess emergent. What does that mean? That's basically me calling the I it lack emergent and the I you excess emergent. Why is this like, why is this significant? Um, or why do I feel like these terms are necessary to describe Uber's work? Um, is because the IU, the you, the presence that Boober is talking about, even though it's always present, um, <laughs> only man himself can position himself in such a way that the you can become sort of present. Um, so that's why I call it a kind of emergence. Um, and that's actually what's very significant about Buber's thought is that even the I, right, is also becomes emergent. So it's not like just the you, it's that the I also becomes its full, its fullest when it's in this reciprocal relationship between the I, you, right? When it, when it's in the I, you relation, the I is full and so is the you. And so it's it's a completely emergent uh, I, <laughs> basically. Um, so you're not even, you can't even, like for Buber's philosophy, the I, without this reciprocal relationship, without the other, is always a kind of separation, which is basically a given. I mean, psychoanalysis has done its whole case on this, you know, the fact that the I is sort of incomplete, the I is a sort of lack. Um, and, and so, but Buber is basically saying that you yourself as an I cannot like achieve your own becoming basically. Um, it has to be between you and another, like only you and another can achieve this becoming in this reciprocal relation because we reciprocally condition each other. So there is this becoming, and it's funny because like, when you read an I and thou, there's like no sense of this. Like there's no explicit words like becoming in this way. <laughs> um, I without the other, yeah, sad face. Um, but also what's very important too is like the I, it isn't like, it's not an evil relation, I, I think. That's something that people like kind of downplay. Um, the I it is just like a necessity. You know, it's it's our daily life. It's the fact that we have to use language. We have to be in a kind of structure. We have to make up rules. We have to give. Um, oh, man, Boober would say so much <laughs> to Sartre. <laughs> I mean, he. Boober's critiques are like ironically pretty funny in my opinion. Like he's, he's so, um, he was such a savage when I read um, Boober's critique on, on Heidegger, I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, basically he says like Heidegger goes so deep in abstraction because he decides to ascribe attributes to existence itself. And that's why Buber has a problem with Heidegger is because Buber, I mean, Heidegger just talks about these abstract, like he just talks about existence in a very abstract way where for Buber, if Heidegger does this, he's sort of missing the concrete relations. And the only concrete relations for Buber is literally between you and other beings, you know, this can be animals, this can be between men. Um, this can even be like works of art that inspire you, but like literally because Heidegger attributes specific relations to existence itself, this is why Buber has a problem with um, Heidegger. Um, <laughs> like Kendrick Lamar control verse. I'd have to look at the control verse for Kendrick Lamar again. Um, but yeah, more, more on this topic of uh, lack emergence and excess emergent. Um, the reason why I like using these words now, lack emergent, excess emergent, um, is you can see how lack emergent is basically the I it world, 
it's the fact that everything has a lack that leads to a response. Meaning that even if my explanation of this whole thing is lacking, um, which is inevitable, uh, or somebody finds my responses inadequate, it allows for that person to come up with a response to what I'm saying because I'm not sufficiently saying it or I am not defending Heidegger. <laughs> so they feel the need to defend Heidegger. So this, this culminates in a lack of margins, basically. Um, and that's, that's the I it world for Buber. This, this lack emergence um, and everything's a sort of lack emergence. And what's kind of funny about that also is that the lack emergence also has like a sort of like womb-like behavior. Um, you actually get this sense from Buber's previous work, like before I and Thou um, in Daniel where he talks about the holy insecurity. Um, so Buber's main critique of the I-it world, or what I'm calling lack emergence, is the very fact that Buber doesn't, like, it's a necessity, but for Buber, you can't just have the I-it world. Like, there needs to be something else. Um, so the I world's not evil, <laughs> but you need something else. Like you need something more than that um, because there's something more than that that actually makes you human. And that's the part that Buber is really adamant about, the part that makes us human, not the necessity parts, the parts that actually make us human. Um, so yeah, the I world... It's not a bad, um, bad world. It's not evil. He doesn't. He doesn't give. A, Buber doesn't give a valuation like that. The only evaluations that Buber gives are people that <laughs> don't try to present their. They don't try to present their whole being. And this is this was also very hard about Buber. Is like he he uses the word like whole being. Uh, you'll find in Daniel he will use like. They have to be at the edge of being, right? This this confrontation, um, and it's weird because when you really try to explain the IU relationship, um, there's this sense of like a passive subject, but it also is supposed to resemble suffering. Um, and so I do like the word edge of being, the way at least the translator put it in Daniel, um, because I think the edge of being kind of gets at more when Buber says like, present your whole being. You know, what does it mean to be at the edge of being? Um, I think Buber's critique is that most of the time when we're engaging with people, we are specifically picking out um, we're, we're specifically like using partial actions to engage with people. Um, we're always specifically extracting qualities, quantities about people. And so this engagement for Buber is never really dialogical in nature. <laughs> um, ma mainly because every time we in engage with somebody, we're always kind of like doing this assessment. Um, and if you're doing that assessment, you're reducing that person to a quality, um, a kind of label or something. So that that would be the the, the I it world or what I'm calling the, the lack emergence. Um, but then there's the IU relation, which people often confuse with um, empathy. Like I just need to, um, be empathetic um, and, and, and experience the other side. Um, unfortunately, the reason why I don't like the term empathy and actually Buber has his own critique of empathy. Buber's main critique of empathy is that actually, which is very similar to Carl Jung's actually, um, <laughs> surprisingly enough, um, is that the person that is being empathetic for Buber, 
he loses himself in the midst of experiencing the other. So basically it's a profane experience of, of, of a mystical experience where the mystic sort of melts into God or feels that he is, and he loses himself. Buber's whole critique of I and thou, basically, if there is a main critique, it's the mystical one. <laughs> it's the fact that the mystic melts into the other. And Buber hates that. He hates that whole logic because it has led to um, disastrous ideology. Um, you know, mystic sort of refraining from the world. So in this case, what's ironic is that even though people always say Kant for Buber, um, actually Buber is a, like he's extremely Nietzschean. Like he's extremely Nietzschean. You can, you can literally hear that the Nietzschean elements of Buber, um, it especially became more apparent to me um, when he talks about creation. But again, the way Buber takes Nietzsche, I think is that he makes it relational. He makes it deeply relational. He makes becoming relational. Um, he makes creativity relational. It's it's a definitely a, a definitely a Nietzschean twist with a bit of like a Kantian paradigm. It's almost like the I it relation is the Kantian paradigm, where it's like time and space is you know from innate um, and so on. But. <laughs> Uh, that th these are the the elements, but anyways, yeah. So you lose yourself with empathy. That's the main point, and that's why Booper doesn't like that understanding. And it's funny because actually, when you look at contemporary kind of like society, popular culture on empathy, that actually does seem to be the case. Um, people kind of have like no sense of themselves while experiencing the other, and that's completely different for the I and you relation. You have to be able to experience the other while maintaining your own ground. That's like the very specific and I think different point um, that Buber is trying to express here, that you have to be able to hold on to your ground and yet experience another person's ground at the same time. So it's like a paradox, but for Buber, you can't you can't have this situation where you have the other melting into you or you melting into the other um, because that's just not relational. That's just not dialogical. You're having a monologue at that point. Um, and I think Buber would say ultimately empathy is that kind of has a kind of like monological character. Um, yeah, mystical union. Actually, I would say it's funny because Buber's against union, but I think there's room to interpret Buber where, and this is the betweenness, where what is un what is unity or what is union is actually emergence. Like union as emergence, unity as emergence. Um I think there's room to argue like that case because <laughs> even though Buber's like, he eventually like discards the whole idea of like unity being possible because he wants to maintain the, the grounds between two beings. Um, I think that betweenness, what is between them, that can be the emergence of unity union um, where the re the relation itself is that that union, not not the two um, uh, going into each other. Um, some of the more difficult things to parse through <laughs> the paradox of ground mystical union, yeah. Um, the mystical not one, yeah. It, it basically is. I mean, Buber is definitely trying to do like a quotidian mysticism. It's like an everyday mysticism or it's like you don't you're not you're not trying to like put religious grounding higher than your mundane life. It's the fact that every day is this possibility of 
like an I thou relationship, basically. Um, it, it's about the turning. And, and it's funny because I've been thinking about Derrida's critique about hyper presence, hyper being, where Derrida critiques the mystics for basically not like they're not really not knowing, basically, <laughs> which is weird. Um, it, it's the sense that mystics have a negative theology where they say they can't talk about God. Um, but Derrida critiques them for that because they are basically implying that they know God is just that the language doesn't suffice, essentially. So in essence, for Derrida, this isn't even faith anymore because the mystic is still implying that he knows. It's just language is not good enough for it, basically. Um, and Derrida doesn't like that. Derrida doesn't like that at all. He wants it to be the other way around where true faith is not knowing it's only knowing that you don't know, right? You, you For Derrida, you have to stop there. It's knowing that you don't know. You can't say that you don't know and yet basically know. <laughs> uh, that, that's the that's Buber's critique of hyper-presence or like hyper-being, where even that negative theology is just a, a veal for, a veil for uh, hyper-presence. And, and it's funny because... The not knowing as a sneaky pseudo. Yes, yes, that's basically Derrida's critique. Um, and I've been rethinking Buber, and I was like, oh, I think Buber actually escapes this because he doesn't turn it. He doesn't turn it on God. It's the presence itself that's emergence. Um, so that means for for Buber, it's not that you know. You have to like make the presence emergent. You have to you have to position yourself in a way that you make the presence emergent. Even though the presence is always there, for Buber, it's not about knowing the presence, which this is the part where I think he actually escapes um, the hyper-presence uh, critique of Derrida. It's that you have to become addressed. You have to become addressed by the, um, the, by the presence. That's the whole point. You're supposed to be addressed. You can't speak to it, but it can speak. You can't speak about it, but you can be spoken to. That's like the very subtle difference. Um, what was Bruber's religious stance? Is it, categor <laughs> is it categorizable? Um, I mean, so he's, he's, he's a Jew. <laughs> he's, he's definitely a Jew. Um, a probably Hasidic Jew. Um, ironically, a lot of the critiques of Buber are Kantian, but I think what's completely missing out of that whole logic is like the influence of Hasidic teachings. Um, Jews, yeah, he, he is, I mean, well, it's a little bit complicated. Like he is Jewish as in religious orientation for sure. Um, especially the Hasidic tradition, which was a big influence, but in terms of like actual practice, Buber wasn't like a, he wasn't like a dogmatic or anything. Like it, it's, it's, it's weird to explain. Like, cause I recently read his um, subtle distinctions between religious religiosity and, and religion. And for him, it's religiosity that gives birth to religion because religiosity is the encounter of that addressment that then eventually has to be expressed. And because it has to be expressed and it has to be told, um, it falls into a system and dogmatic creeds and principles and so on. So for Buber, there's always this possibility for religion to be created new, um, recreated, like it basically needs to be so for Buber because then we're not like, you know, creating anymore, which is like the whole purpose <laughs> of like co-creating, I guess. Um, but yeah, his, I think, yeah, I think a lot of the tax on Buber are, cause I, I initially thought this too. I was like, oh, Buber sounds Kantian, but like with a twist, you know, it's like, oh, the, the numeral can talk to you basically. <laughs> like the numeral is personal. Um, but then I also realized that Khan just probably takes a smaller role in Buber's thought.
where it's like Nietzsche is probably the more significant one, and then the Hasidic teachings. Finally, a person, who, <laughs> yeah. Um, which, I mean, a personal noumena, I feel like kind of, I don't know. It, I feel like it kind of breaks some of the things with Kant, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just I haven't given too much thought on that, but I feel like it kind of breaks it. I'm not sure. Um, but I, I don't I don't really compare. I don't really like comparing Buber to like Kant because it just it doesn't get at what Buber is trying to say, in my opinion. I feel like it's like it, it's a distraction. It's like trying to reduce somebody to like their historical setting, um, which I get it. But also at the same time, I think he's more like a Jewish Nietzschean <laughs> slash Hasidic teachings kind of, uh, you know, philosophy. Um, he, he ultimately calls his work a uh, philosophy that's, you know, anthropology, basically, an anthropology philosophy. Um, because Buber is between, it's, it's between man and man. Like it's that, that for him is the most concrete. What is between man and man? That is the most concrete for Buber. It, it can't be anything else. It can't be cognition, can't be anything else. It has to be man in his fullest self. Um, and I think that's like the anthropology part that is Buber's philosophy is that it's this whole man. <laughs> it's not his ego. It's not his id. It's not a super id. Like for some reason, Buber hates all that stuff because it, it, it reduces man to his parts. Um, so it has to be like the whole of man. This is the whole of man, which is frustrating a little bit only because it's more ambiguous. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, that's also kind of what makes Buber enjoyable to me is that he has this um, relentless sort of ambiguity uh, for it, which I think, in my opinion, like, it sort of provokes um, a sort of like reinterpretation of Buber, um, even like a badly interpretation of Buber, which I, I think I'm kind of, I'm like attempting to do actually like a sort of bad interpretation of Buber where I, I just start talking about like excess emergence and lack emergence instead. Um, what did Buber say about fetishizing the other? Um, about fetishizing. So basically, like the fetish, the fetishing of the other is the reduction, like the loss of the like wanting to go into it, like feeling like you are it, basically. Um, he has this whole critique about like feelings and how feelings accompany the metaphysical reality of love. But for Buber, love is not just a feeling, it's, it's like a responsibility. So it's love as a responsibility that gives birth to the ranges of of feelings, but ultimately predicating it off feeling is kind of missing the point for Buber. And I think that's where for Buber, if you're using your feelings, you're sort of fetishizing the other in that way. Um, which ironically, if you do that, you can isolate, you can reduce yourself to an it, or you can reduce the other to an it in the midst of doing that. And there's a line in Ein Thou where he says, you can have different feelings for this person and you can have a different feelings for this person. Like it, it's, it's so such a variable related thing that sort of like calls for no responsibility, no real true action because you're sort of predicating on a feeling basically. <laughs> it actually kind of reminds me of Derrida's critique on responsibility where the very fact that we have to depend on some type of cognition process, some type of, even exterior process to to know something is actually like irresponsible <laughs> like for for derrida that is actually like the the aporia of responsibility where because you have to 
know something before you make a decision you have to sort of like depend on some type of process <laughs> some type of criteria to to make that judgment and depending on that is sort of irresponsible for uh derrida which i think to follow that in with buber's critique on feelings it would be the same thing like you're sort of depending upon your feelings to make judgments and that for buber is sort of like irresponsible whereas having love as responsibility itself is a little bit more true i guess do you have a hot high and down relation coming up this friday Saturday night? <laughs> i don't know i don't know uh i know what is it i know saturday i think they're celebrating my birthday because i'm turning 30. <laughs> Um, man, man, Cadell, you should really see me in my, um, my psychology and religion class because like, I'm like a co, um, thanks. <laughs> I'm like a co, uh, whatever discussion lead, I guess. Uh, and it's crazy cause these kids, they're killing me with like this echo chamber bullshit where you know, we're talking about like height, this evolutionary psychologist and somebody raises the question like, oh, so do you think it's better to be in groups and versus, you know, being an individual basically? And I'm like, I'm hearing this question. I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and then like every person in my entire group goes, yeah, it's, it's good to be in a group. It's, it's good. Yeah. Way better than not being in a group. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I was like, I was like, Nazis were in groups. <laughs> I was like, you can't just fucking tell me like it's the groups are just innately good. <laughs> um and <laughs> I just I just I, I just couldn't like get over that fact that like I was like literally hearing like just an echo chamber of Hyde's thought within the discussion. I was like, really? Nobody has like a substance of like thought here on why possibly uh, it might not be, you know, groups. Sure, it's groups. It's a given. Groups can be good, um, but you know, who who determines the group's direction? <laughs> How do we know <laughs> that they're not all being manipulated? <laughs> Philosophy has made college discourse. I, I mean, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> most of my, most of my, my counterparts, my my religious like other people that aren't religious studies. I mean, it, it's it's kind of sad because it's like they they come in with already a like there's no discovery for them, which is crazy because I I think typically people associate college with like oh, you're going to get introduced to so many things. You're going to really change your mind. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, I, I don't think that's true. I think most people come in like they're not going to change. If you're already open-minded, then sure, that's a given, like what's happening to me. But if you're not, then most of those, my religious studies majors are actually not really open-minded. They come in basically just to affirm their own religious identity. And then they come in conflict when they hear like historical readings of their religion and so on. And, I, and I'm like, man, I'm just so happy. I don't have an identity for religion to attach to because I just, I just don't care. I mean, I'm, I'm more interested in like coming up with something new <laughs> Or coming up with something, reinventing something um, for religion to have. Uh, and I'm just not interested in these sort of paradigms. <laughs> Let me see. In college, you're introduced to a whole new type of fascist democracy. I mean, yeah. The, the, the very fact that the school doesn't let you double dip. Because, for example, my major requires a minor, even though they say that you can double dip, um, 
they always say you have to be careful because sometimes the one class that would be a double dip is not a double dip. And that means you have to take another class. So everything is sort of catered to the fact of like, basically you paying for more classes because double dipping just isn't allowed. Um, and because that isn't allowed, it makes you take up more classes. And it's the same thing they do. Basically, they do the same thing to veterans. They want you to run out of that GI Bill. They want to run that GI Bill dry. And then you uh, <laughs> and then you still have to pay for more classes, basically. Um, they want to make it more difficult to satisfy the criteria for your major. So that way you end up paying for more classes, being there longer, using up the GI Bill. So they get all of your GI Bill, then some. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan. And I'm also not a fan of the fact that school doesn't let you fail. I feel like most of the learning is predicated off of that. Uh, double dip sounds like you're talking about sauces. Don't double dip in the sauce. Yeah, yeah, no double dipping. <laughs> Nobody likes a double dipper. <laughs> but it's not like it's my major or anything. <laughs> Can't just double dip when it's my own. <laughs> I felt like that was like guaranteed. <laughs> Georgie double dip, Jerry. <laughs> oh man. But ironically, my worst class is Japanese 101. <laughs> that class is kicking my ass, man. <laughs> it's crazy how fast that class is going. <laughs> Oh, man. But, you know, Cadell, my hip-hop and God class, that, that class is gold. That class is gold. I mean, we just be, like, listening to rap in class, and he's like, yeah. I'm like, dang. Heck, yeah. Talk about God, Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> oh, it's so, such a funny. It's such a fun class, even though it's only once, once a week. <laughs> Terry Double Tips. Yeah, no, it, it's a it's a fun class. It sucks that it's only one one day a week. Um, I'll definitely go there more often. Um, yeah, it's a super fun class for sure. And then ironically, um, the class that I didn't think was going to be like the most philosophical, like the class that I just took for like just like literally because I needed like an art requirement. I, I'm taking like a Japanese like popular culture class and that class is ridiculously philosophical. <laughs> like I'm reading academic articles and I didn't even expect to be reading about Deleuze, Foucault, um, was it Baudrillard, um, and all these people within the popular culture paradigm of, you know, technology, media, everything else and i'm like damn okay <laughs> it it does seem like media philosophy likes to lose his terms because it's consistent with like flows this embodiment um that that's like i'm getting like my hunch on that like they really like to lose his um What's it called? Yeah, his his terminology. Have you studied how much a dollar costs? No, but I actually think that's a that's a I think that's a song. Ironically, I wrote a little bit about that song, I think, in my summary on street theology. Um, I think so. I might I think so. Um I just wrote it, but I fucking was stressing out. Anyways. Yeah, we have to write like a 10 page paper on a song that he lists. And I think how much a dollar cost is on that list. I think so. Because he does like Kendrick Lamar. I mean, he literally, like, my professor devoted a whole fucking chapter to Kendrick Lamar. So I don't doubt. I feel like it's definitely on there. And if it's not on there, I'm pretty sure I could ask him if I could do it for a 10 page paper like analysis on a song which i'm still bugging out like how i'm going to do a 10 page paper like on a song analysis but i mean we'll see i mean i did six so i could stretch out four more pages <laughs> uh, 
Now, Kendrick Lamar was great. Um, uh, reading in it, my my professor's book, it was it was awesome. I, I love learning about Kendrick Lamar in that case. Um, yeah, I was super super enlightening. I I didn't even know uh, I would write it on Rap God. <laughs> I mean, man, I think hip hop is the new theology, and I, 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 I would take it, and I would say rap god is the new paradigm, for sure. I would take it like that. Rap god is the new paradigm, <laughs> um, and hip hop. I mean, if anything, I'm I'm definitely convinced hip hop can be a kind of theology for sure, um, especially with like my professor's term of like righteous rap rappers, which is like the closest thing that we have to actual prophets. Um, uh, and, it, and it's crazy because the, the historical pool, the historical pool on uh, like oral tradition, you know, the fact that scriptures were not just simply read, but they were meant to be like orally saying and kind of like have like a kind of like rhythmic tonation to them. Um, when my professor kind of like makes that argument, and that's very true, but most religious traditions did have like an oral tradition that was more musically inclined. Um, then like, yeah, like hip hop actually is like that modern uh, case. But I think it's funny because it's like, you have this weird, uh, dynamic of like Plato's critique of poetry where it's like there's that kind of like that that side of rap <laughs> and then there's like the righteous rappers kind of rap <laughs> future philosophy for classes are going to be organized towards producing your own hip hop album <laughs> oh you know what uh, yeah that'd be fun we, we are supposed to write a rap song for my class, though. So I'll let you know. I'll let you know, Cadell, when I need some 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 dope rhymes. I think I'm supposed to hit up um, Dimitri as well. <laughs> He's like, let me know when you write it. I'm like, all right, cool. Because <laughs> I'm like more poet style. I'm not like a rapper. <laughs> To beat your guys to treat yeah i heard i heard yeah he, he's yeah he told me he told me he's recording um he's gonna record a rap song uh, <laughs> so yeah i'll be looking forward to it um to listen to it uh damn yeah <laughs> oh my god he's braiding his hair now <laughs> oh god <laughs> my uh my one friend he was like he's like javier i think you need to like get away from like all this hip-hop stuff he's like you're he's like, he's like you're becoming like too ghetto for me <laughs> these are the contradictions could that emerge in i and our relations <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. Are you making reference to Dimitri? Hi, <laughs> pretty. <laughs> you... <laughs> I mean, I have to think more about if Boober. I mean, no, it has to be. I, no, I, I can't. Yeah, it has to be. Like, becoming has to be within that realm of relation. So um, I think that's funny. <laughs> but I do think because um, can Boo really think modern hip hop? It's a good question. But I would I would think modern hip hop in the context of Boober. Actually, my professor quotes Boober in um, his, 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 his book. Um, but yeah, I think, I think actually hip hop totally fits into Booper's paradigm a hundred percent. 
because it's about remixing, cutting the past to make something new again. It's the very fact that like all rap songs have some type of like cutting, remixing of like the 70s, 60s, 50s, whatever the case may be, like Kanye's uh, Praise God. Man, Kanye's Praise God song, like introduction, is it's so hard. It's like a woman talking and then it just like, it just drops. Like it just, it just bangs like right after that, like whole conversation in the beginning. And every time I'm like, ooh, if I could just make a documentary called like Hip Hop I and Thou, like that would be, that would be dope. <laughs> <clears throat> Perhaps modern hip hop is actually just a brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely would say it's definitely a form for sure. Um, I don't think Boober would expect it, but I don't think Boober would be opposed to it either. <laughs> what would modern philosophy look like if Boober wrote praise I take it and release a control verse? <laughs> Man, I don't know, man. It, it's it's so funny because like Boober and Heidegger, they took walks together. You know, they were like basically friends. Um, but I think it's like one of those things where it's like you just disagree with your friend. Um, and it's ironic because it's like um, obviously there are still some tensions left between Boober and Heidegger, especially with like the whole Nazi stuff and accusations. But I think ironically, Buber didn't like, I think he was like the one that he didn't let that, like he didn't let that like stop his engagement with um, Heidegger, at least from what I recall, I, I'd have to look again, but I don't think that actually was like the disengagement from him. I think he had some disappointments about Heidegger, but he was still ultimately close to him, I think. Um, yeah, I think the one, the one, the one question that is always raised when I'm reading Buber and then I think Heidegger again, which is a very similar question to uh, what Daniel raises sometimes, which is still kind of like an unknown territory, is like, does Heidegger actually think relations? Um, but then I, but then again, I think the question is also problematic because how Buber conceives of relations is like very particular, you know, it's, it's not like a given that there is this relation. <laughs> it's not a given that every day we have a monologue. I mean, that every day that we have a dialogue. <laughs> Do you think if Buber was live today, he would collab with little baby or the baby? <laughs> Man, I don't know, but I bet you if there was like some like Hasidic rap, he would be down for it. <laughs> Collab with little baby, with the baby. Oh man, is it the baby? Yeah, I think it's the baby. Um, that one song where he dresses up as the the Joker. It's like, I love that song. That's a good song. That's a good song. But it also tells a lot in that song. Something to prove. <laughs> <Be true. laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I would think so. I, I think Boober would be cool enough. I'm not sure. He sounds cool enough. I mean, I would think so, right? His whole his whole philosophy is on relations. Um, so I would I would think he's pretty open minded. I mean, and and the other thing is that apparently Buber was also like pretty true to his philosophical standing in person, from what I've read. Um, can't tell if you know those are just glamorizations or whatever. I'd be curious to hear what Heidegger thinks. Uh, I don't think I've heard um, 
I, I think there has to be like letters between Heidegger and Buber that are out there. <laughs> I'd love to read those. There's definitely ones between uh, Buber and Carl, Ro Carl Rogers. Yeah. Um, Martin <laughs> Buber featured Mac Miller and the Beastie Boys. <laughs> Were they all Jewish? Was Miller was Mac Miller Jewish? I didn't know that. I mean, I I mean I don't really know the evaluation. <laughs> Mac Miller is Jewish. <laughs> you know what could tell? My uh my YouTube chat immediately was like, hide or show this comment. <laughs> My YouTube channel, my YouTube chat's already like, mm, inappropriate comment, possibly. <laughs> Do you approve? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, I approve. <laughs> and uh, the same thing happened. I showed you the same thing happened when you put the Jordan Peterson comment, which I also thought was hilarious. Um, and it asked me if I wanted to show the comment or not on the chat. <laughs> I was like, what? Why are you asking me this? <laughs> That's a given. Show the comment. <laughs> My geez, just show the comment already. <laughs> YouTube is that's me, JP. Dude, it really is. <laughs> it's like hardcore censoring him. Um, which sucks because I enjoy reading his stuff. I just, you know, I just enjoy it. You can't, you can't critique them if you can't hear them. <laughs> you don't get new material from critiquing if you don't hear the guy. Um, <laughs> and that's that's the other thing. That's the other thing. Oh man. Um, but side note, Cadell. Th this was funny. I was. I don't know if you're familiar with Jonathan Heights like evolutionary psychology maybe you are um but it's funny because I, I remember i was like in class and i was like mm, maybe the internet is like the hive mind wouldn't that wouldn't that be wouldn't that be more accurate <laughs> that like the internet is the actual manifestation of like the hive mind um and it would make sense with with his co-evolutionary kind of paradigm where culture evolution sort of feed into each other into evolving mechanisms uh which i thought was interesting um because i just learned that somebody's trying to resurrect a woolly mammoth and that we would only be able to do that, do that through culture technology <laughs> So uh, that means we can like start to retroactively pick from the past <laughs> to the future. Um, <clears throat> look, of course, Boober wouldn't even call this future. Same thing with Derrida. Derrida wouldn't call this future. Because um, you have the future has to be completely unknowable. <laughs> but Derrida does make a good point on even if you do know what would come out, um, he's like, it's still unlivable and it's still unexperienceable. So boom, you still don't really know. <laughs> so many dope, uh, old bio forms you need to bring back. Man, they're also take over the NFL. Ooh, that would be freaking awesome to watch actually. <laughs> Just like, you know, they just like beat each other with their like helmets. I'm like, well, I've seen that before. But except I've never heard it with grunting. I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> it would be like a, we create a fire for like the halftime show, like a big fire, you know, like a super big fire. <laughs> and they'll be like, oh. All sack records get broken immediately. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Actually, 
I would totally love to watch a football game where it's Neanderthal Neanderthals versus AI. Like, if we get to that point, I would love to watch that because that would be fucking hilarious to me. Just like you just see like a Neanderthal just like take like a fucking leg of an AI and just beat them with it, you know. Or or he starts worshiping him. I mean, that would be also hilarious. I mean, I I would also laugh. Like the game stops because they have to pray to the AI. He's like, Nanthros probably wouldn't be able to QB. So the AI, QB AI, <laughs> Nanthros linebackers. <laughs> Robots versus Neanderthals would be a good movie. Yes, I think it would. And then, you know, just throw like Will Smith in there or uh, Samuel Jackson. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> I would, I would genuinely enjoy that movie. <laughs> oh, man. But there's like. Will Smith as AI also grows. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Dang. So Will Smith would basically be like the cyborg version. Um, I'm surprised they even haven't haven't made that a Marvel. Or you know, he's DC. They haven't made that yet. <laughs> a cyborg movie. Russell Crowe's oh man, Russell Crowe would be perfect for that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no problem. Me too, Cadell. It was nice, nice, nice for you to stop by, man. Good talking to you. All right, man. See ya. Take care. And also, bye guys.